Big thank you to Adam and Jennifer this morning. Yeah, Adam's got a little insecurity, evidently. Bless his little heart. He can't get out of his own way this morning. Just doesn't believe in himself. and just. Jen doesn't have that problem, though. No, Jen has got a nose full of herself. She can do it all by her own lonesome. You know, as we begin to look at how we move through life. We've been talking about hunger, hunger Games, and in Hunger Games we've been talking about what, how do we have to be hungry spiritually and how do we get to where we need to go. Now the first week we talked about the fact that no matter how great a meal is, physically we can't live on that all week. We talked about no matter how great a teaching is, you know, if we were to go and have the greatest uh, piano teacher in the world teach us once a week and then we never practiced, we would never get any better. Having the wisdom doesn't do anything. Daily, we have to put it into practice. And so we said, one meal won't get us. One teaching won't get us. Spiritually, we can't have one opportunity to grow in the Lord and then do nothing with it all week. It has to be daily lived if it's ever going to be part of our life. Number two, last week we looked at fuel or flab. We said, okay, if we do eat every day, do we use what we eat or do we just let it go to flab? Because, you know, and we talked about the three different types of people. That there's the person that does nothing and everything just goes to wait. We talked about the second person that eats in such a healthy way that their body is able to naturally burn it all, which is better health. You know, you make a better decision. But the athlete is where you really want to be. Because when you burn everything that you eat, you get to eat all the fat and good stuff too because you're burning it all. You're using it to make a difference. And spiritually, we want to be able to have a smorgasbord of what God's doing, but not just to make us spiritually, uh, you know, heavy. We want to do it so we can be spiritually fit. That's the reason Paul talked about us being athletes. Now today, we're looking at the dynamic of, okay, how do I relate to other people? How do we interact with one another? And as we interact where we need to go, because some people find themselves going, I don't have anything to offer, I can't sing, I can't speak, I can't do, you know, I mean, uh, just like a dig a ditch for Jesus, right? You know, and, you're, and they're the Adam kind of person, you know? They're, I don't know what I'm going to do, I don't know where I'm going to go. And then you've got the other people, like Jennifer, who are, I can do it all myself, I need none of you. I appreciate that you're here along for the ride, but uh, stand in my shadow and applaud. And you know, <laughs> So... You know, we can be arrogant, you know, and, and quite honestly, probably most of us are a little bit of both. We have certain areas where we feel very confident, like we need no one. Then we have other areas where we feel very insecure. And usually in the areas where we feel really insecure, we just try not to get caught, right? Stay low enough below the radar that no one will ever figure out I'm not that sharp, right? And we feel that way, all of us in different areas and different places. So today, we're going to find out where's the health and the balance between Jennifer and Adam, we don't want to be so arrogant as though we need no one, but we also don't want to be so insecure as to feel like we have nothing. But what does the Word of God say about us, and how do we function? That's our goal. The parable of stone soup is so true of our human nature. Most of us feel like we have to hoard the little bit that we have because we don't have that much. And, you know, I certainly don't have enough to share with anyone else. And yet in the parable we see that the stew that everyone had the opportunity to share from was greater than any one of them individually could provide for themselves. They learned that when they all bring a little bit to an endeavor and then share it between the group that brought it together, they actually end up with a better end than what they started with. That little bit that they gave was mixed with the little bit that everyone else had to bring something that they couldn't do themselves. And in life, our human nature kills us that way all the time. We're placed in a position to where we're so afraid to lose the little bit that we have or to participate because what I bring isn't good enough or what I bring is better than the other people and you're not and you're not, I don't want them to benefit from something that I've worked so hard to do and and what ends up happening is we don't have a better whole now this morning we're going to be looking at first Corinthians chapter 12 when Paul uses our human body 
as an illustration of the way that the community of faith, the body of Christ, should work. In fact, whenever anybody uses that Christianese term, the body of Christ, they're saying that because of Paul's very powerful illustration. Now, one of the things that I love, I mean I love, is when I see something that the Bible teaches that people look at and go, yeah, right, yeah, right. All of a sudden, scientific evidence shows that it's been true all along. You know, one of the things, I watched the movie A Beautiful Mind, which is a great movie, by the way, but it talks about uh, a man who actually was schizophrenic but a math genius who came up with a bargaining problem that revolutionized the world markets, and he won the Nobel Prize for this. Everyone had always assumed the greatest good comes when every person does what's best for themselves. In other words, our own initiative will always take us to the highest level. He, pro he postulated this and got the Nobel Prize in economics for this. The best good will not come unless I do what is best for me and best for the whole group. I'm going, 2,000 years ago, Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than to receive, and that I need to love my brother in the same way that I love myself. I need to be as concerned for my brother as I am with myself. I go, that's not new knowledge. We just finally decided we were going to figure it out. Back in the 1920s, 30s, when Darwin and Einstein were first working on their understanding of the world, if you were to walk up to someone and go, Genesis says one time there was nothing, and then everything showed up out of nowhere. They'd have looked at you like you had three heads and the most ignorant person on the planet to believe something as stupid as that. In 1960, it was confirmed that the Big Bang Theory was the only mathematical proven way to understand the universe, that at one time there was absolutely nothing and then everything showed up from nowhere. There's another principle that I love. Now I'm going to throw a book cover up here for you. James Suiki has written a book called The Wisdom of Crowds, and it's all research studies on how crowds, large, diverse groups of people, can come up with better solutions and better understanding of everything that we deal with in life than even experts can pull off. So, in 1 Corinthians 12, 12, we read these words from Paul. The body, our human body, is a unit. And though it is made up of many parts, and though all of its parts are many, they form one body. And so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized into one spirit, into one body, whether Jews or free, I mean Jews or Greeks, slave or free, we all were given of the same one spirit to drink. In other words, he goes, we are like a human body. Lots and lots of diversity, lots and lots of different individuals with different strengths and different skills and different opportunities and different uh, ex life experiences, some with great education, others with not so much education, some with the school of hard knocks having taught them what the people with the education couldn't possibly know because they haven't walked through that, but diversity in all of its parts. Now, in the book, uh, The Wisdom of Crowds, they went through a couple of things, and here's what they discovered. They discovered that large, diverse groups of people, crowds, will almost always come up with better answers. Now, they did a bunch of studies like this. They did a jelly bean study. Anybody ever been to a carnival where they had a bunch of jelly beans in a bowl and you had to guess how many beans were in there? Well, they did this over and over and over again with different number of jelly beans, with different shaped containers and all that, and people had to guess what was in there. Now, what they would do is they would take all of the guesses, you know, a, a couple of hundred guesses. They would throw out the top and the bottom, crazy ones, and pick the middle, di cert, you know, take that number, divide it by the number of people in it, and that number was always more accurate as to how many jelly beans were in the bowl than any of the individuals, save a couple. And here's the thing, the few that got it right on this jar weren't the same ones that got it right on the next jar, nor were they the same ones that got it right on the third jar. It was different people every time that were better than the average, but no one person ever beat the average of the larger crowd. They went through over and over looking at large crowds making decisions versus small people or experts. Now, 
One of the ones that was just really, uh, you know, to me was really interesting was as they were doing this research, uh, the U.S. Navy lost a submarine. Now, anybody ever dropped anything into the swimming pool and watched it sink? And it goes, and kind of sits down. Well, they had the same problem. The submarine lost power, said Mayday, started down because they couldn't blow the ballast to get it back up, sank to the bottom of the ocean. They're trying to find it. They had brought in every oceanographer, every expert, and they could not find the submarine. So, with Zwicky's work and looking at, at some of the other stuff, they got a large group, a couple of thousand people. They gave them all the data that they had. And we're not talking about people that know anything about the ocean or anything else. Just great big old crowd. And they all were to look at, at the data as best they could, talk about it, try to figure out where they thought this thing would go. They gave them the tides, you know, the currents, and what was going on, and about how heavy this thing was. And a whole bunch of people, random, just individuals, started plotting where they thought this thing would land. When they got done, they looked at the cluster of where the largest group thought it was, circled it, put a dot there, and guess what? They found the submarine within about a half a mile of where they thought it might be. Crazy stuff. Now, I'm going to tie in why that is important. As we begin to look, there, they said there are four conditions that characterize really wise crowds. Here's the first one, diversity of opinion. The second one is independence. The third one is decentralization. And the fourth is aggregation. Now, those are big words, so let me break those down for you here. Diversity of opinions. You've got to have a whole bunch of people that have a whole bunch of different experiences, a whole bunch of different understanding. They've got to be really diverse. They can't be, you know, we, we all came from this school. We all grew up in this neighborhood. You know, we all think the same, you know, do all that. Second, independence. They've got to be able to say what they really think. They can't be walking around going, well, you know, I don't know very much. You know, what would you say? Yeah, I'll go with that. Right? No. They've got to be able to stand up for themselves and go, no, this is what I think. This is my wisdom. So they've got to be able to do that. And then decentralized, again, they can't be uh, from one specific place. People, uh, you know, who are specialized or draw on some local band of knowledge. They've got to be all over the board for this to work really well. And then the last thing is aggregation. At some point, you've got to pull them all back together, all of their opinions and everything else, into an answer. So they've got to be diverse, I mean, uh, really uh, diverse. They've got to be independent, stand on their own. They can't be coming from the same backgrounds. They've got to have a wide variety of backgrounds. And then finally, you've got to pull it all together. Now, it says the group must be big enough and diverse enough the members must uh, be forming opinions independently, and then the group must be decentralized. Now, thinking of that, listen to what Paul says about what the church ought to look like. He picks up again, 2 Corinthians 12, in verse 14. Now, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. And if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body. Here's Adam. This is Adam, right? I'm not a foot, so I don't belong to the body. I can't do anything. I'm just, right? It would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? Now here's what Zwicky says in his uh, research studies. He said, grouping only smart people together doesn't work that well because the smart people tend to resemble each other in what they can do. The group knows less than it otherwise might. Adding in a few people who know less but have a different set of skills actually improves the group's performance. So what he's saying there is if you get a whole bunch of really smart people, a whole bunch of experts, a whole bunch of oceanographers, and you put them all in the same room, they're normally they've been educated, they've been gone through the same process, they've worked through the same scenarios and whatnot, and they don't, they're not as smart as if you put a bunch of people in there that don't know anything about it to question them and to ask questions. He goes on, and he says, groups that are too much alike find it harder to keep learning because each member is bringing less and less to the table. They spend too much time exploiting their knowledge and not enough time exploring the other possibilities. So, 
Anybody that would be in Adam's situation goes, I don't really have that much to offer you. I'm not that smart. I'm not an expert. They go, hey, listen, if all we get is experts, we're in trouble. We've got to have a bunch of people with just common sense, general knowledge with different experiences. If we're going to get to a healthy place, we can't just have all the talented people running this. You know, the people that have all the knowledge or all the wisdom in this area. We've got to have a whole bunch of other people if we're going to be healthy. He goes on. He says, the best collective decisions are the product of disagreement, contest, not consensus and compromise. Now, here's the thing. The Bible says that we are to be like iron sharpening iron. You ever tried to sharpen anything by hitting iron and iron together? You know what you get? Sparks and friction, right? (laughs) That's how they get sharpened. And the Bible says that's the way it's supposed to be. There's supposed to be a lot of sparks flying. But I'm telling you what, you look at most, most human nature and most churches in particular, it's like if we ever have conflict and something's wrong, because we shouldn't have conflict, we should all just agree on everything. We, there should never be a dissenting opinion. And if somebody does say something that we don't agree with, we need to get rid of them fast, because that'll, that'll just ruin our order. And, we, uh, and Zwicky goes, no, you do that, you're going to be very, very dysfunctional. The healthiest groups that get the healthiest place with the best answers and the best understanding of how to move forward are people with widely diverse people with widely diverse opinions challenging and asking each other to think harder to look deeper to make better questions to work together they always get a better answer and that is exactly what Paul says here he goes we don't need a whole bunch of eyes or a bunch of ears he goes we need a whole bunch of diverse people all over the place with varying understanding we need you know we we got to do this so he goes on in verse 20 He goes, uh, and then we get to Jennifer in verse 20. As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the hand cannot say to the foot, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Now, you remember he's not talking about a human body here. He's talking about our relationships with one another. Well, here's what Zwicky says. He says, a large group of diverse individuals will come up with better and more robust forecasts and make more intelligent decisions than even the most skilled decision makers. A large group will always do better than skilled decision makers. And we'll talk about that in just a second. He goes, even brilliant experts have biases and blind spots. So they can make mistakes. What's troubling is that in general, they don't know when they're making those mistakes. Experts don't even know what, uh, don't even know when they don't know something. Now here's the thing. Uh, You know, uh, Cody and Carrie Russell, uh, we've been doing t-shirts for their little son, Brooks, who has a tumor in his spine. She took him to doctor after doctor after doctor, and doctors are great. Doctors are incredible, but the one place where every expert, doctor or otherwise, will run into problems is when what I'm saying doesn't fit with what they know, quote unquote, to be true. And doctor after doctor kept saying, you know, this is just, you know, it's just a learning thing. You know, he's just going through. And she goes, no, there's something wrong. And doctor after doctor said, you know, it can't be, you know. I, I, I have knowledge. I have wisdom. I've been through this a hundred times. That's not what, and all of us know that experts every once in a while are blinded by what they think they know. And then all of a sudden, she finally, finally, after over and over and over again, taking him back and back, finally someone runs an MRI on his spine or whatever the test was and finds that there's a tumor there. Why? We get blinded by cause we think we know. Nowhere in the world has that been more evident than in the church. I mean, we have had to go back and apologize for slavery, for the Crusades. I mean, you know, and, and why? Because in the church we go, pardon me, I know. Uh, pardon me, I know. 38,000 denominations that all can't talk to each other about this because we all know. Jesus said of the Pharisees, you're so meticulous about your expertise that you strain out a gnat in one spot, and then you swallow an entire camel in another one. And what he was saying is, that, you know, you could be so meticulous in one area about this thing, and then the other one, you're dumb as a rock. 
You know, it's just like you swallow the whole thing. It's just ridiculous. Why? Because the second I think I know everything, I set myself up to miss the most important things. My expertise will hurt me. In the long run, he says, I cannot say I don't need you. We need every voice. In fact, the healthiest crowds, the, most pro the best problem solving comes when every voice is heard. Now, let me go on uh, with the verse 23. He goes, and the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable, we treat with special modesty. Well, our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lack it, so that there should be no division in the body but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. So we've got our Adam and our Jens. The people that don't think I need anybody, the people that think I don't have anything to offer, both are wrong. In fact, as we look at scientific research today about large crowds, large crowds will beat the expert almost every time. A large crowd will beat individuals almost every time. And the reason is because collectively we are healthier than when we are trying to go on our own wisdom, our own knowledge. The church, according to Scripture, is supposed to be that diverse group of people that each challenge each other, that call each other to think deeper, to look harder, to grow better, and most churches fall below that challenge. We feel like there shouldn't be any conflict. There shouldn't be any questioning. You know, I mean, you know, the first time somebody comes in and goes, well, I just don't believe that. You go, well, we just need to make sure we put them on the back row and kick them out. <laughs> they don't believe what we believe. Can't let that go on in here. No, maybe we need to let a little bit of that go on in here, right? Maybe that's what's got us so dysfunctional. We've become so cookie-cutter, pigeonholed, that we, like the Pharisees, strain out enamels and uh, strain out enamels. Enamels. I haven't had enamel before. Strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Enamel is the hybrid gnat camel. So let's read this. And this is important. Don't conform. When one person realizes that a clear, uh, they are clearly a nonconformer in a group of conformers, they tend to conform. Why? Because I don't want to be the, the one voice that's bucking the crowd. We all tend to want to fall in line with whatever the crowd's saying. He goes, but having even one other person in the group who felt as they did made the subject happy to announce their thoughts and the rate of conformity plummeted. In fact, I know, I've known this for a while. I used to tell my kids, I said, you know, if you ever have a bunch of your friends and they say, you know, hey, you know, let's go over to so-and-so's house, you know, and get wasted, and right, right. And you know, everybody goes, oh, cool, yeah, let's go, let's go. I said, just test this thing out one time. Go, I really think that's a bad idea. I said, I can almost guarantee you there are other people in that crowd going, hey, I, I, I'm with Cameron. I think that's a bad idea. I don't think this is, <laughs> nobody's going to speak up until what? Somebody says it. It doesn't matter how many people are thinking it. Somebody's got to open their mouth. And many times we think there's this great conformity and there's not. How many times in the church has the church been heading or going different directions and everybody thought, well, everybody else thinks that. I'm the odd person. You know, I should just keep my mouth shut. And if the mouth had just been opened, maybe we would have been saved a lot of heartache. Because I think if one person had said it, other people would go, I, I struggle with that too. I, I don't know that that's a good direction. I'm not sure that this is healthy. And things might have changed. In fact, he goes on. He goes, we encouraged people to make incorrect guesses, act, and it actually made the groups as a whole smarter. They actually put people in these studies to go in and talk nonsense. They just told them, I want you to go in there and just disrupt the whole thing. You know, say things that, that you know aren't true. And what happened was when they said, you know, I think we ought to do this because, you know, it'll produce this kind of result. People would go, oh, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait a minute. And the discussion that followed created what? Clarity of thought, deeper insight, more firm about where we were heading before than this. All of a sudden, you know, and, and so how many of us in here in the Adam syndrome are going, you know, if I say something, it might be wrong. Good. Good. 
Because when you say wrong things, even, it causes us to rethink and to repurpose, and we get better answers. That's the reason Paul said everybody's got to be in the game. We all have to share. We all have to be a part. If we put only experts, we won't get the best thing unless we've got a bunch of people that don't know anything about the subject also commenting on it, chiming in. In fact, at the end, he said, the more information a group has, the better its collective judgment will be. So you, may, so you want as many people with good information in the group as possible. Verse 26, Paul finishes. He goes, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. You know, one of the reasons I'm so excited about uh, the, you know, as I begin to actually finish the rough draft of my book, it needs a lot of work, but at least it's getting there. It's almost there. But I am arguing that what we need is an awakening for a Romans 14 church. And in Romans 14, it says people have varying different convictions, and yet they still respect, they love, and they honor one another. It's exactly what Paul was arguing for when he wrote Romans 14, and, and when he talked about the body, that's exactly what he's talking about. Every part, diverse, different, different places, different insight, different understanding, challenging each other over and over and over again, and yet still caring and loving for one another. When he gets down to the end, isn't that what he said? Because we have to love each other. We have to care about each other. We have to walk together. We may disagree. We may challenge each other. When we ta- challenge each other, there may be some sparks. That's okay. Because if we have the heart that no matter where we go, we're going to say what I believe, I'm going to walk in what I know, I'm going to give my piece to this puzzle, but when we get done, we're going to choose to love each other and honor each other and go, I know our ultimate goal. Our ultimate goal is to know God and to walk together as healthy as we possibly can. You may not agree with me on every point. Paul said, that's okay. God will sort all that stuff out later. Let's just live up to what we know. Let's walk in health. You're needed. You are necessary. If you find yourself at some point like our Adam this morning going, you know, I just don't have that much to offer. Good. Offer what you got. Challenge. Even if you say something wrong, it'll still improve the score. Why? Because it causes us to think deeper. It causes us to look at the problem some other way. You know, it was interesting. uh, They had a, a truck get stuck in the Holland Bridge one time. And they brought in all these experts because it was going pretty fast. And when it wedged itself in there, they were afraid it did structural damage. And so they're in there, and they're doing all these calculations, trying to figure out how in the world they're going to get this truck out from under there. And after hours of problem solving, a, a man walking with his daughter down the road, the little girl goes, why don't they just let the air out of the tires? They let the air out of the tires and backed it out. Experts were all looking at the problem, and they couldn't see the easiest solution. The little girl, who had no expertise whatsoever, looked at it and thought, well, why don't they just let the air out of the dirt? And the problem is solved. Sometimes it's the simple things that God uses to confound the wise. But if the little girl had never said anything, they'd have been there for hours and hours more. What you have matters. Some places you'll be smart. You will carry the wisdom that the group needs. Other times, you will carry the peace that the wise would miss. But every single one of us are to be a part. Because in our ordinariness, there is brilliance. Father, we ask that you would help us to realize that we are part of the body of Christ, and we are an integral part. That, Lord, we would not uh, let our insecurities rob us of our place in the body, of giving the thing that you have called us to do, whether we share a gift or a talent, Lord, whether we uh, give an opinion that helps us to think just a little bit differently. Lord, we have a voice, and you said that we have to be there. Father, for those that, uh, like me, uh, tend to run my mouth too much, Lord, that you would open my eyes, that I would see that, uh, that I have blind spots and that I need to listen You said that we need to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to react, that we would be great at valuing one another. God, let us be that Romans 14 church with incredible diversity, with people who think independently, who challenge one another. 
But then we come together as a unified whole to get the wisdom that we need to live our lives, to make this church have an impact in the lives of every person that enters here. God, do that work in and through us. In Jesus' name, amen.